So Ravel, the great pianist, and interesting enough as a pianist, he, believe it or not, played 15 national and international competitions and won none of them. <laughs> so after 15, he decided maybe focus on that composing thing because it's working really, really well. He was a very private individual to the outsiders, the people who were not his close friends, but he was incredibly charismatic to the people who knew him. So in fact, he was part of a group, um, and I think it's certainly t turn of the 20th century, there were a lot of groups. The one I, we, we know is the Mighty Five, the, all the Russians with Balakadev, you know, and, um, and, and, and the Russians that actually lived in Paris, and Ravel knew a lot of them. But Les Apaches, which translates to hooligans or outcasts, were actually a very interesting group because not only were they musicians and composers and performers, but they were also artists, and some of them were actually critics. So when researching this, I was thinking, well, this is a pretty good gig, so you can get your critic friends to review your music. Yeah, maybe I should do that. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> start forming that group immediately. So, um, the point of the group was to kind of push thought and the ideas of compositions like you're about to hear. Um, and someone like Ravel, who was a master orchestrator, a master composer for the piano and for the woodwinds and for uh, the, the, the percussion, he was incredibly good at that and he was able to kind of bounce that off people he really, really admired. The piece we're gonna talk about today was actually an homage to his not a close friend, but someone he admired greatly, and that's Claude Debussy, who was, I think, eight years older than him. And this entire piece is kind of an homage to what you can do. What's interesting about it, and we'll talk about it when we listen to the examples, is that Ravel was not terribly comfortable writing for the strings, though he did, obviously, the incredible string quartet is, and, and Tigan for violin and orchestra are, are two works that you're very familiar with. Um, but what we'll do is we'll go through this and we'll talk about how a composer, for example, uses string instruments to imitate other instruments and so on. So our first example of the sonata is, um, is, is in, from the first movement. And the first thing we have to talk about is scales and, and how it's constructed. Um, most Western music is major minor scales and that's kind of the foundation of what we do. But this is more of a pentatonic and some of it is even elements of whole tone scale. So I'd like to have Till maybe explain that to us just a little bit. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Gary. So Ravel, we know and love Ravel, and we think of him often as an impressionist, but that's really oversimplifying. Of course, we think of Debussy as an impressionist, much like with paintings, you know, Monet and others. Uh, but with Ravel, it's a little more complicated than that because he was also a modernist. And it's in this piece that we're going to hear today that we'll hear some of his more modernist tendencies. Now, first, I'm just gonna play a little scale on the piano, and you're going to hear something that we would call a pentatonic scale, penta meaning five. So that's not very modern at all. In fact, that kind of goes back to much more modal and tonal roots. So let me give you the yeah, microphone. Sure. So this would be a pentatonic scale, and you'll hear that in the example in just a moment. That's not the modernist side, but what's interesting is what he does right after that, and then throughout the rest of the work. You, I'm sure you know what a major triad is, and what a minor triad is, but what Ravel does is he basically combines them. And then we get this very dissonant sound, which is, I'll, I'll try not to go too in-depth with it, but it's either called a split third or a simultaneity. It's when you have dissonances that happen at the same time. And then the left hand, or the, the other side of it, is also adding more dissonance. So we have... We have this simultaneity if, uh, if that's happening with the counterpoint. Thanks, Gary. And in fact, uh what, what Till was just describing is the very opening of this sonata, which I think our example is a little bit different, but he does combine these two triads, which gives us um, sort of an unstable, but a wonderful mood where you just kind of don't know where you are, but it, it's ethereal. Let's listen to the first example, please. So yeah, this is, more, this is more of a playful thing, but the very first example here is a whole tone pentatonic scale that we talked about. And it's, it's a buoyant sort of a playful thing. Um, we really should talk about what 
Ravel himself said about this piece, and there's a wonderful quote that I want to read to you. Um, essentially, he said that this music is stripped to the bone. Its harmonic charm is renounced. And there is an increasing return to emphasis on melody. Now, when we think about melody, like even with Beethoven, for example, so you have melody and accompaniment. But here, he actually re removes it completely. And he, he makes the melody intertwined with more melody, which I think makes us listen to it in a linear manner as opposed to a harmonic manner. It's never really vertical. Right, and so uh, going back to what I played on the piano a moment ago, there are definitely melodies throughout, but the way he's weaving them is very specifically so that they're overlapping each other, and some of the lines get lost, and it's very purposeful, and it creates another layer of what we might think of as dissonance or something that's maybe a little difficult to listen to sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting, the kind of dissonance you're talking about. Uh, when we were preparing this this talk, we were talking about Bartok, for example, and much of Bartok's, especially sort of Eastern European flavor, he does kind of dabble in it, but this work is inherently French, and its its ability just to create this mood, a lot of it is for the other senses, a lot of it is for the smell and, and for the eyes as opposed to yeah. just the ears. So it's a very special work. Our next example is from the second movement, and What's important before we listen to this example is to remember that Ravel knew about jazz. Jazz made its, its way to Paris very early, and he loved it, as Debussy did. So there's a lot of boogie-woogie going on here, and it's a lot of stuff that you really would not expect, especially for a duo of two string instruments. Let's listen to number two, please. So it's a wild movement, but if you listen to the cello line, especially when you hear it live, you'll see that uh, it, it is really, really percussive. In fact, I think of this second movement, really, I mean, it's a painful thing. I, I want you to feel sorry for me. <laughs> Cellists cellos play plucking all the time. I've got calluses here I never knew I had. So I was actually going to ask you, uh, in that movement, do you play quasi guitarra? Do you, do you play? Never. That's a great never. question, okay. actually. Okay. Um, so if I do my job right, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, <laughs> the way he writes it, how, how you cannot play quasi, well, let's talk about quasi guitar for a moment. Quasi guitar is you take the instrument and you put it down here, like a guitar. Like a guitar, right. Right? Well, the amount of time he gives you between Boeing between Arco and Pizzicato is at times less than an eighth note in a in a tempo that's da 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 one sixty. You, you <laughs> there's can't barely change. enough time yeah. for me to come back. In fact, you'll <laughs> see there's one spot where I don't actually go back to the grip. I have to hold the frog like this, yeah. like like a sword, because uh -huh. there's not enough time to go back and forth. You know. But this movement shows so much um, diversity, really, in the uh, the timbres of the instrument. Yeah. Uh, the, all of the pizzicato and trills and other, uh, practically everything you can do with a string instrument, he does in this movement. And he also imitates the harp, he imitates the cymbalom, the great Hungarian instruments, he, woodwinds, their harmonics that sound like flute. Yeah. It's, it's in some ways, everything but a string yeah. instrument. True. And it's really fun to play, except it's painful. OK, uh, let's talk about the slow movement, which to me is, is the heart of this work. Remember, it's an homage to Debussy, who died two years earlier. And he died in very tragic circumstances. You heard us in the last concert. We, we did the, the Debussy Sonata, which was one of the six he was commissioned to do by his publisher, Durand. Only completed three of them, all of them short, because Debussy knew he was dying of brain cancer. So you, you got, you, this, this is a very serious work and in some ways a very hypnotic work. So let's listen to the third example, please. Yeah, so I was just going to say that the, um, from your standpoint as a performer, doesn't it take a lot of patience to play something that it's not plodding, but it's moving slowly? Yeah, interesting. Uh, so the first time I played this piece, so, sorry, this is going to be a long answer. Everybody strapped themselves in. 
I was probably 18 years old, and I went to my chamber music teachers, and I said, guys, you know, I'm doing my best, but nothing happens here. So help me out. And of course, they didn't really give me a great answer. Well, now that I'm not 18 anymore, we won't do, talk about it. <laughs> I've discovered that I think the way this is written and really needs to be performed successfully is it's a very slow blossoming, like an unraveling, almost a slow burn, you know? So the economy that we talked about before, the way he writes linearly without accompaniment, that's the entire idea that you have sort of a, like a long arc and the movement, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know, is seven minutes long. And in this long arc, there's exactly one tempo change. Mm -hmm. but, but the note values do change, and that's where I think you're talking about this evolution. Yeah. It's slow, but it's not plodding at all. And exactly. And it unwinds, and, and you yeah. hear that evolution. Yeah, I think at first it's really hard on the ears because we don't know what key we're in. I'm not sure where it's going. But I found the most successful way to listen to it as a musician is to let that go. Yeah, okay. You don't look for what, it's not there. You yeah. look for what is there. And what is there is this incredible arc and you have to sort of trust it. And it took me like yeah. 30 years to figure it and out. And by the way, my conducting More. teacher, <laughs> my conducting teacher in college said that I would not be able to conduct slowly until I was older. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Now, the final, the, the finale, the last movement here is incredibly joyous. And we should say that Ravel, who also died relatively young and also under some tragic circumstances, when he knew that he was gonna go, he wrote his most joyous music, like the G Major Concerto. Um, this is a movement that is an homage really to where he was born, because he was born on the border of Spain and France. And so much of this is, is castanets, and again, percussion instruments that would be indigenous to the country of Spain, not as much to France. This is the next example, please. <laughs> What we heard there, what I find really interesting is that he's actually bringing back some ideas that we heard earlier in the work, kind of brings it full circle. And it's back to that modernistic kind of dissonance, which- Change of meter as well. Change of meter. And also he accomplishes this dissonance by pitting the different lines against each other. So one of them is playing in essentially one key and the other one's playing in another key. So well, you might actually call it polytonality yeah. And, and who was really famous in America for that? Charles Ives. I was gonna say <laughs> I was gonna say Bartok, but, Bartok, but not, 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 actually that's no. true. He was in America. Yeah, he for, was too. At the end, yeah, yeah, uh. for sure. All right, our next composer is rather unknown here, and um, I'm not sure I can give you a great reason for it, other than he was he spent his career as a teacher, um, and he was someone who was very adhere to, I would say, to the great romantic tradition of Wagner and early Strauss. Um, he also taught Zemlinski, loved Mahler, um, you know, loved his music. And uh, it's interesting that we were talking about Strauss and the late Strauss, where he would go in the direction of atonality and polytonality, but his last four songs, 100% tonal. Yeah. If you didn't know that it was written in, shortly before his death in the late 40s, could have said yeah, it was you're 1880s. talking about Strauss's last four songs, yeah, yeah. obviously. Strauss's yeah. last songs, yeah. yeah. So this work for viola and piano is unabashedly romantic and beautiful, and I think in, at the time it was written, it was probably difficult for him and for the intelligentsia to kind of accept that, you know, you have Schoenberg, the second Viennese school, Webernberg, very famous, and here's this guy in Vienna who is writing romantic music. It's, I just find this so fascinating to go back and imagine what it must have been around this, at this time it would have been 1912. Mm -hmm. And there is so much happening in music in Europe and it's kind of centered around Vienna. So, I mean, you have Schoenberg writing Piero Lunaire and Erwartung, which are very, they're beyond romantic. They're now almost atonal. And then you have Mahler writing his Ninth Symphony, which also just goes beyond the late Romanticism. But then you'll hear in, in this example in a moment, this is nothing like that. This is pure yeah. Romanticism. Indeed, and, and it's actually very bold and masculine. In some ways, again, if I wish I knew more about him. I'm wondering if this kind of writing affirms the idea that I don't need to apologize for loving this kind of style. It's what I do, you know, take it or leave it. Yeah. Let's listen to the first example, please. This is number five. Thank you. 
So we have one more example, actually, from the first movement. Again, much more chromatic, actually, sort of searching around for this. This, you can see, is very masculine, sort of bold statement music, whereas this one is ever-changing. Let's listen to number six, please. What we heard there was a very um, well-known and well-used kind of sequence where there is something called modulation and sequence, where you're moving from one key to another, but he does it with chromaticism. He's just constantly moving, and we don't know where he's going to land. Exactly. In this uh, slide, I just wanted you to, if, in case you're wondering, he is there in the middle and uh, with some very interesting people in 1940, and it looks like it's after a concert, but um, just remember that in the age before iPhones, this was a very hard shot to snap. <laughs> Probably took a lot of preparation. So while you're looking at that, let's listen to the slow movement, which is gorgeous, intimate. Uh, you know, the, the timbre of the viola is so special because it really overlaps two timbres. You've got the tenor and you've got the alto timbre. So this is something a violinist can never do. I'm terribly jealous. Let's listen to that example, number seven. That actually does have a very Wagnerian kind of romanticism, doesn't it? Yeah, and it, it's just pure love song. Yeah. It's, it's nice that our performers are married, so it's really something that's <laughs> very natural to both of them. Yeah. Um, finale. So, wild und sturmisch. You want to tell us about what that means? Yeah, so wild und sturmisch, it's almost like it sounds. Wild and stormy yeah. is what it translates as. Yeah. I always love to, to hear the Sturm und Drang from Mozart, but obviously this is a huge evolution from that. Yeah. It's a lot of imitation, a lot of uh, sort of whole tone writing, and it, it's passionate beyond belief. Let's hear that example, please. Number eight. Yeah, very exciting work. I hope you enjoyed it. It's the first time, obviously, Corneth has been performed on this series, but it's very rare that it does get played. So um, the, the, the Littons uh, did a CD, uh, an album. You can't say CD anymore. They recorded an album during the pandemic about this, and so this is something that I think you'll enjoy. Quickly, let's go to George Gershwin. Um, we're going to play two works from Porgy and Bess. Um, I was very lucky to be actually in Charleston some years ago and I visited the house where this was composed. But the most important thing you have to understand is Heifetz in his time, um, he not only played the piano really well, but he loved popular music. So he actually commissioned George Gershwin to write a violin concerto, which George Gershwin did in fact start, but because of his tragic death, of course, never completed. And the way this first example, which is best you is my you is my woman now, not R, but you is. <laughs> <You> is. <laughs> um, it's, it's rich and delectable writing, which I think imitates in some ways the chorus in the opera. Um, and it's a love song which will make you believe that you're not listening to one instrument, or two instruments, but one yeah, the way primary I, instrument. The way Heifetz arranges this, it's just beautiful. It really sounds like more than just a violin. Exactly. Lots of double stops. Here we are. N next example, please. Number nine. So our next um, example is from It Ain't It Necessarily So, and George Gershwin in it, I mean, he just imitates pure jazz. Um, Yasha Heifetz, as you can see in this slide, was really one of the very greatest virtuosos. Some 
myself probably included, would say the greatest of all time to this day. Um, and he makes this work really sing. It's, it's jazzy, but it's also very violinistic. And so in many ways, it is the very best of Heifetz and it's the best of Gershwin. Let's listen to it, ain't necessarily so. I think this is humid writing. Wouldn't you agree? Did you say human or humid? Humid. Uh, humid. Yeah, humid. Yeah, because, yes. Because Charleston is <laughs> yeah. right on the water. But I was going to say, though, during the excerpt that it's so perfect for the violin because you can imitate the voice so well with the glissandos, and it's going to be great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of my very favorite works. Yeah. All right. Um, so these are just slides from, from, from George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. Um, it's been done, actually, at the Met. So now these days, something that started out that maybe was on, on the cusp of repertoire is absolutely in there. All right, let's get to the most, the biggest work in this program, and probably in some ways the most strange because it has double bass in it. Um, so usually a piano quintet is a string quartet, two violins, viola, and cello, and piano. But Schubert was using bass probably for very practical reasons. Sometimes he didn't have enough violinists. And this happened, I think, for Haydn as well. He would use the orchestra he had. But you know, I actually read up on this a little bit, and I read that there was another piece that was supposed to be performed and rehearsed, and Schubert said, well, this is a great arrangement of instruments. Let me use you all. And, or can I say y'all, we're in Texas. <laughs> I'll use y'all, and it was the same instrumentation, and maybe that's one reason. Exactly, yeah. But I, I just love the idea that you can be practical and still write a masterpiece at age 22. Yeah. So um, the thing to remember, as usual, is Schubert was the great songwriter. You know, he wrote over a well, thousand songs or Well, something thousand. like close to that, yeah. yeah. So he would write all the time. And what we need to remember is that all of us, if we were living in Schubert's Germany or Austria, we would have a piano at home and we would have a stack of sheet music like this, most likely half of it from Schubert, right. because uh, whenever we would have a musicale or we would have a dinner or something after dinner, you're going to do a, uh, a yeah, Schubert you, song. You yeah. all hang out in the salon and, and play music together. Yeah. Yeah. So our first example is from the first movement, which is, it, it's, it's frequent modulation as Till explained, but it's not the kind of modulation, of course, we heard in Ravel because it's very natural and sort of dovetails from one key to another. You don't even notice it's happening. Let's go to number 11, please. Could just say real quick, all of the arpeggiations that you're hearing, both in the piano and then imitated in the strings, is, is a unifying element in this piece. And it comes back in, I think, just about every movement, whether it's fast or slow, we'll hear the same um, you know, glue that's holding it all together. Exactly. And just in terms of technique, I mean, for all of the instruments, I, I always add in these pre-concert talks that the great composers, they were very complicated music for so-called amateurs. They didn't worry about whether, you know, Mrs. So-and-so could play these arpeggios. This is really hard, hard work for, for the professionals. And I think that at the time, Schubert was like, look, this is what I got, you know? Yeah, yeah. Go learn it. I, I wrote it, you play it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Our next example is from the slow movement, which is so gorgeous. And again, it opens with a viola uh, foundation. It's really not a solo, but it's, it shows our, like, sitting by the fireplace. It really sets the mood. Let's listen to number 12, please. Sorry, that was still from the first movie because it is the highlight of the double bass repertoire. Yeah. This is the big bass solo. My dad gets to play it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So you, you'll, you'll hear in the, in the first seven minutes what a bass solo sounds like in yeah, chamber I mean, music. How, yeah, how often do you get the bass getting to do Very solo rarely. Like Rossini that. wrote some stuff, but that's yeah. about it. Now we can listen to slow movement number 13, please.
Well, I was going to say that the, here's another example that we just heard of the idea of modulation when you're moving from one key area to another. And Schubert does it so seamlessly and so wonderfully. There's something called tonicization when you're trying to create a new tonic, a new home key. And he just keeps moving that goal until we finally arrived somewhere we didn't know we wanted to be. Exactly. It's just so buoyant and so light and, and, and delicious in the way he does it. Um, there's scherzo, which, as you all remember, means joke. It truly is a joke. This is not a Brahms scherzo. Right. <laughs> um, and it's all really five instruments enjoying the fun they can have with a certain melody. Let's listen to number 14, please. <laughs> Yeah, and so the meter, uh, when you're thinking about the rhythm and the, the way the rhythm all fits together, is you're, he you're actually hearing three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. That's what you'd expect from a scherzo. And then when we get to the middle section, which you did not hear this time, but you will in the performance, it kind of relaxes the tempo a little, it relaxes the mood, but it's still in three. So it's almost like the whole minuet in trio, only it's exactly. scherzo in trio. Yeah, beautiful. Um, there's a variation movement here, and I really want you to know that Variations were written by these guys, not because they were short of ideas. Certainly Schubert had incredible ideas. But I think the beauty of this variation movement is they can take the same melody and invert it and play around with it where it changes its guys in such a way yeah. that you almost don't recognize it. And then you can bring it back, which he does in the end. Yeah. Let's listen to number 15, please. And in that one, you also heard the bass once again. And that's the beauty of a great variation or set of variations is you're not only changing the melody, you're changing everything around it. And you have these different instruments to whom you can give the beautiful melody. Yeah. So for everybody, for most people, it's a huge piano variation. But the melody is actually in the lower strings. Yeah. And so it's, it's always this wonderful tug of war, but it's not a serious tug of war. Mm. We haven't had a fight about this once yet. Well, there's, we'll find out in a little yeah, while. That's right. Exactly. The finale, again, is full of joy, um, and it starts with something where you don't know what the meter is. So I think in some ways, this is Schubert kind of paying a little bit of an homage to Beethoven, where he could always move things around. That's what I was, it's so funny, just today I was listening to this excerpt and I thought, this, there's so much Beethoven in this. Yeah. I mean, he starts and we don't know where the beginning is. Yeah. Let's hear number 16, please. <laughs> So you can see that this work is a timeless work because it has everything. It has variations, it has building, it has wonderful solos for everybody, and it's incredibly fun for us to perform it for you. I'm so thrilled that you were able to make it to this pre-concert talk. Happy New Year again, and in about 15 minutes, we'll start the concert. Enjoy.